Governor, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with us today. Um, My pleasure, Tim. First question, you were a champion of the 38 Studios deal. It turned out to be a massive failure, and now taxpayers look to be on the hook for $100 million. Do you owe the people of Rhode Island an, an apology? Well, there's a whole lot of, you made a lot of statements there that I think are uh, only partially true. First of all, I was a supporter of that, uh, and uh, you know, as I think I've indicated before, this was a lengthy process we went through. We had a whole board, 12 people, Tim, uh, that were leaders in, in the community, business leaders, uh, community leaders, uh, labor leaders. Uh, and we spent months analyzing this. Right? And, 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 and it will, comes across as somehow this was done quickly. No. And we're definitely going to dive into the due diligence that you did. But I, I think just, you know, for a lot of people sitting at home, with all due respect, they, they haven't heard anyone uh, offer an apology. They haven't seen anyone even take ownership on this. Don't you think you own a piece of it? Well, I own, I, I'll, I'll take responsibility for having it approved on my watch. Okay, there's no doubt about that. And I'll take, I'll say I was a supporter, which I was, uh, uh, along with, as I said, the whole board. Out of 12 people, all right, there were real leaders in this community, not people who are going to follow just because they think I want to do a deal. They're not going to do that. I know all of these people. That's not why I put them on the board. Only one said no. So a lot of work went into this, and everybody had high hopes that this could be the nucleus of something for a whole new industry in our state. Digital media was something that was growing nationally. Uh, internationally for that matter. We had some pieces of that already in place here in our state. So we thought that 38 Studios could be the nucleus of something. Now, what happened after we approved it and after I left office, I don't know. Okay, I cannot take any responsibility for that because I have no information. Uh, I'm no different than uh, John Q. Public in terms of what went on. I have a lot of questions because to me, uh, the fact that the EDC you know, the governor seemed to be surprised in April of this year that they needed money and are out of money. It's shocking. I mean, there is, there is something desperately wrong if that were the case. All right. I, I think that there's a lot of elements of what's happened here that I think you could put a good news, a good spin on, if you will, in terms of what the company was achieving. The well, fact that it failed. What is the good well, spin the, on they this? They got the first game out. They actually produced the game. It was financed by EA, which is the largest distributor of games in the country. Well, that's nice for uh, EA, but not well, no, no, nice but for the people around. My point is, when you're going, you're building a studio and you're trying to recruit a company, you want to see that they've got an ability to do what they're going to do and what they say they're going to do. They demonstrated that with the first game. Now, clearly, they didn't have enough money to complete the second game, which is the large one and the complicated one and the one that basically the state was helping to finance, if you will, by guaranteeing uh, the, the bondholders. But whether they could have succeeded with a little bit more money, and that's a whole different question, but certainly there was a lot of time. Uh, nobody should have been surprised in April that they were running out of money. That's something that could have been seen six, eight months before. And so that part of the equation, to me, I have the same questions that uh, most people have. Well, why? What was going on? What was the state or EDC doing to try and help if they needed more financing, which they clearly they did, to complete the game? I'm interested in uh, that you said uh, whether they could have moved on with a little bit more money, um, and, and we'll get into that. But let's talk about what you did know. People at home need to understand that as governor, you're the, you were the chairman of the Economic Development Corporation. You, you know, what did you see? that private investors ac across the country didn't see, that the governor of Massachusetts didn't see, that others warning against this deal did not see. What made you think that this was a safe investment? Well, first of all, probably four months of, of work on it, Tim, all right? We, we, this is something where <clears throat> after we made the first contact and it looked like he was excited that he'd been shilling, excited about this company and the possibilities, and I said, we'll contact EDC, and EDC made contact. And as that developed, all right, then I think could a coincident with a strategy that we had been working on within economic development to build a whole digital media basis here in the state, a whole new leg, if you will, for the economy. Uh, Several pieces, all right? You, you, when you look at somebody who's building a business, who was building a game in this case, or, or a movie, whatever, but this was a game, it's so they have the talent. Do they, do they have the people and the resources right, to get it done? 
Uh, what's their track record? Uh, and in this case, I think there were a lot of pieces there that when the board reviewed all of this, and we had outside consultants come in who understood the industry, we had people do the look at the financial projections. Uh, we said, look, uh, here's a company that's building a game, the first game, uh, and, and it looks like it's proceeding. EA, who was one of the leaders uh, in the industry, was financing that. They put up a good chunk of the money to do that. Uh, and that was moving. Uh, they had some of the best creative talent, some big names that were creative talent. And, and you look at all the pieces of that, and we said, look, with some help in terms of the financing structure that the state put in place, this looked like it could be a win for the state. 300 people employed here. That's the sad thing about the failure of this company, which is that 300 people are out of work. Uh, clearly, when a company fails, it's the responsibility of the management. There's no doubt about that. All right, and why, I don't know. We, we at the time, looked at me. They had a good financial team. They had a good management team. I uh, had hired a chief executive uh, who was very professional. Uh, so I think the pieces were there. So you're putting some of the blame on 38 Studios and quite frankly, let's be frank, on Kurt Schilling, the businessman. Well, you have to, okay? When a company fails, it's the leadership that's responsible. What I don't know, and the question is, did it fail because it just needed some more money? Or did it fail because they didn't know what they were doing, couldn't produce a game with that? That doesn't look like what happened. Because as I said, the first game was completed sold, they actually was a reasonably successful game. Uh, so they had demonstrated it, it an ability. It was reasonably successful. It sold 1.3 million copies. But we know now that their revenue projections were based on selling a whole lot more. And even Electronic Arts, who you mentioned, uh, didn't think they were going to sell $1.3 million. Shouldn't you have known that? That their uh, revenue projections were way too robust? Well, you know, a, a projection is just that. It's a projection. It's your best guess in terms of what you're going to do, Tim, all right, in any business. But, I, but I again, lived in it speaks businesses. To, we're, we're not experts in this industry. No, no, but, but that isn't the question. The question is the revenue projection is important in terms of whether they have enough financing and whether they'll have the cash flow to complete the second game. Uh, and, and, you know, as you and I were talking uh, off air, I, I think that the key is and if there's a fault for Schilling and company that I would say here, is that they should have had other plans in the works, and maybe they did, I don't know that, to raise additional capital to get the second game done. My understanding is they had, they had a deal working to do a sequel for the first one. Mm -hmm. So this, this was not a failure of, it doesn't appear to be a failure of a company that didn't know what they were doing. It was a failure in that it wasn't financed adequately to get the completion of the big game, which is really where the money was. I, you know, but some people might take an issue with that, that this wasn't a failure of a company that knew, uh, knew what they were doing. Um, you know, you, you think of Kurt Schilling, great baseball player, clearly not a great businessman, and some people think you were just starstruck by the guy. No, not at all, not at all. Look, the, 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 the country is loaded with people who were successful professional athletes who've been very successful business people, all right? There's a lot of them out there. So it, 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 for me, uh, none of that factored into the equation at all, all right? And I don't think it did for the board, I know that, uh, nor did it, I believe, for EDC, who did all of the, you know, the staff and team at EDC had done all of the work uh, but the board had regular monthly meetings for like f four months. We had two special meetings uh, devoting over two hours. And these are people uh, in senior roles in their companies throughout the state uh, devoted the time and the effort to understand this. You know? and, and because we were looking to find a piece, a new leg for the economy, if you will, in the state. Uh, and. Uh, you know, economic development do, for do states is difficult. Do you think they let difficult. you down then, knowing now what you know now? Did the board let Don Kachiri down? No, I think the board, and, and I include myself in that, made the best decision based upon what they felt at the time and the information that they had. All right? And we all felt, we were all excited that this was really going to be something. And by the way, here's a, here's a man who's put his whole life's earnings into this business. I mean, it's not like he came into town and said, give me the money, all right, and I'm going to play with your money. 
This man put, you know, rumors are $50 million, virtually everything he earned in his professional career into this. Yeah, but now we know that he was trying to get private investors before coming to Rhode Island. The Wall Street Journal has reported on that. Many papers have. The private sector passed. Did you know that? Yeah, sure. We knew that he was searching for investors, but often that's not unusual either because when you're, you've got a new company and you've put all your money in, all right, when you're looking for investors, the dynamic is always how much of the company do they want? How much of your company that you've started and you've put all your life savings into are you going to have to give up for them to put the money in? And very often, the, the, you, you, there, it's not uncommon for investors to be asking for 80% of the 90% of the company and it's not unusual for an owner to say no uh, that was obviously the attractiveness of the state's transaction the fact that we were willing to put our uh, if you will moral obligation behind bondholders to put the money in see to me that should have strengthened the company because when they needed more money which clearly they did they were better positioned frankly to, to entice uh, new investors in, have the state having facilitated the first piece of the transaction. But what, what happened there, I just don't know. Let, well, let's get into that in a second, but wrapping that section up there, you, you know, uh, talk about the structure of the loan. Schilling has complained after the fact, and industry experts have pointed out that the loan was structured so that the only way the company, 38 Studios, could get more money was by hiring people. And, and look, you're a businessman. That is not the objective of a business, and it raised their overhead. Do well, you agree with Schilling on that, that well, their hands were tied? Well, no, because you know, that may have been the structure, because obviously what we were trying to do is, is in incentivizing sure. them to come here, make sure that they were bringing people here and employing them. All right? If you had been an issue, as an, he came in and said, look, I need a little more time. It's taking a little longer to develop the second game. We're going to get to those employment numbers. Can you give me a little forbearance? Now, I can't speak for the current administration. I would have been the first one to say, of course. Of course, you want the company to succeed. All right? And to my knowledge, maybe those conversations went on. I don't know. But if I had been there and those conversations would have gone on, EDC was you know, capable of waiving that if you will, we, you know, we do that. You do that all the time. Well, let's have that conver uh, conversation. Schilling has bla uh, placed much of the blame on the current governor on the shoulders of uh, Lincoln Chafee. How about you? Do you blame Lincoln Chafee? No, I can't say that. I mean, clearly he wasn't a supporter of the deal. I mean, he didn't support it uh, up front and was, you know, vocally against it. Uh, and and uh, in fact, I think questioned Schilling's. Uh, you know, the whole bloody sock thing, which mm -hmm. I thought was absurd. Uh, but having said that, the question is, after he was in office, and this is the biggest question for me, what happened? All right, when I was in office, we had monthly meetings of EDC's board, and the governor chaired, I chaired all those meetings. All right, so the question is, they should have been having monthly meetings, <laughs> and at every single one of those meetings, whether it was in the public meeting or a closed meeting, should have been a discussion about the status of 38 studios. When I left, we had contracted, I think, with IBM, one of the IBM divisions, to help provide, get, gather some of the information to provide support for EDC. I don't know, Tim. The question is, was that happening? Now, we understand there's oral updates and not written updates well, see, after the you know, that, you know, that to me, but, but may be part like of the problem. The because, governor should have been more plugged in, if I'm reading between well, the lines here. Well, all I'm saying is that it appears publicly that the governor first found out in April of this year that they were out of money. Could it have been that now maybe that, the that, company wasn't being uh, forthright with information? Well, that, that's possible, and that's what I would be trying to get to the bottom of. But my point is... <laughs> anybody would have seen months ago months ago that this company was running out of money or going to run out of money depending upon the assumption of when they were going to complete the second game all right and it was going to need some additional financing so my, my criticism would be all right and i don't know i have no information as to what meetings were taking place what was happening at the board meetings that's a public record uh, whether that this issue, whether 38 cities was even being discussed at EDC board meetings. All I know is nobody should have been surprised 
in April of this year that the company was out of money. And if they were, if they were, that's shocking and there's no excuse for that. Well, we know they were out of money um, and they were looking for more uh, tax credits maybe to, to bridge the gap. Um, Schilling says they were on the verge of landing another investor. How about you? How would you have handled it as governor? Would you have given them tax credits or more taxpayer money to, to bridge that gap? Well, for, it's very hard to, uh, you know, would I have been open? Yes. But you'd need to do the analysis because the key analysis here is where were they in the completion of the second game, the big one, the multiplayer game, as well, they call they it. They kept pushing that back. No, I, I understand, but th that's, that's what you'd have to convince me that let's say they were halfway through, that for another $30 million or $40 million it would be completed, and then on the heels of a successful launch of the first one and possibly a sequel deal for the first one, are there the ingredients there that if private money were able to, were able to get private investors to come up with most of the money, would it have been a smart thing for the state to put a little bit more in, in the way of film credits? It could have been, but you I can't. You make, would have doubled down. I can't. Well, I can't make that judgment without all of the information. What I'm saying to you is, if a little bit more in film credits from the state would have leveraged a lot more in private investment money, and the combination of those two would have, you know, increased the likelihood significantly of their completing the second game, that might have been the right thing to do. Yeah, but we know, you know, they were burning, according to figures, $4 million a month, a little bit more money. Let's say it's $15 million more. No, it couldn't have been that much, but... Oh, it was. It was that much money. They were burning that much money. And, and, and well, just that you say that... They 300 so people, okay? $100,000 each is $3 million. Well, it, that's... So it isn't... <laughs> This is according to thirty million. Which this is, is according to money. financial documents that we have. They were burning that much money. And again, just for you to say that, I think for people at home, it's like, well, how doesn't the governor, the chairman of the EDC board, know that that's what their overhead was? No, no. We well, first of all, they hadn't employed anybody here when I left office. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I've been out of this for almost a year and a half, Tim. Okay. Uh, so I have no idea how many people they actually had other than what I read in the newspaper, okay? And so I can conjecture, and I have talked to no one. I, have, I don't have any uh, input into EDC, so I have none of this information, all right? All I'm saying is, is, as a business person, I can conjecture what they were probably spending based on how many people they were hiring. You, you, know. you said you haven't uh, spoken to anyone. Have you spoken to Kurt Schilling? No. Since no, the company's collapse, no, you haven't? No, no. Leading up to it? No. no. Uh, there is a lot of finger pointing going on. Everyone in the General Assembly, including Speaker Fox, is pinning the blame on you and on the EDC board. They say, hey, look, we just approved a loan program and had no idea any money, let alone this much, would go to 38 Studios. Is that true? We're lawmakers in the dark. Well, <clears throat> as to being in the dark, I don't know what you mean. I mean, anybody that didn't know we were talking to 38 Studios. <laughs> wasn't reading the paper and uh, you know following the media because it was pretty well publicized and all during the campaign you recall it became an issue uh, but uh, as to I don't blame the General Assembly no not at all I mean their job is to pass laws they they passed a law creating the loan guarantee program it was EDC and EDC's board and I chaired that board's responsibility you know, to oversee that uh, and as I said, I will take full responsibility for approving or supporting. The board actually approved it. I was only one of 12 votes. Uh, and, uh, but I supported it. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I will take responsibility for, for approving the deal. Okay. But, you know, when I, I left office, it hadn't even, as I recall, <laughs> was just beginning. Uh, so all I'm saying is, look, I... I have no knowledge and no input and no involvement after that. And it looks to me from the outside that there were a lot of things that might have been able to be done along the way here to salvage 300 jobs. You know, 300 people are out of work. And, you know, and part of that blame and a big part of that blame has to go to Schilling and his management team. There's no doubt about that. But the question is the state was, you know, heavily committed to this. At least when I was in office, we were. So you want to help. 
I mean, look, when GTEC was going to leave the state, you know, Massachusetts, Mansfield was romancing them. You know, we stepped up and we restructured a deal to keep them here. All right? Uh, Brown and Sharp, the same thing, Tim. They were going to leave. They were being recruited by Stonington, Connecticut, waving all kinds of land and cetera in front of them. We had to intercede, and, and, and we got them back here. You know, so what, you, hearing you know, that's this, what economic just, development is about. I understand. And, and hearing this, it, it sounds like what you're saying is the current administration uh, torpedoed this thing. That's what you're saying. Well, I don't know that. All, all I'm, I can't say Didn't that. do enough. Well, I can't, I, I don't know that, all right? Because maybe there were conversations going on that were not public. I don't know that, all right? And I, and I won't sit here and criticize somebody when I don't know well, you know, perhaps there were a whole lot of conversations going on between EDC, the governor's office, and 38 studios, but they couldn't come to an agreement. That's not been said, by the way. <laughs> you know, standing back, it looks like all of a sudden in April of this year, EDC and the governor and the speaker find out they're out of money. There is no excuse for that, none whatsoever. You know, in, in Lincoln Chafee, Frank Caprio, Gina Raimondo, uh, all as candidates, mind you, urge you to uh, scrap this deal. Um, at the time, you called it political posturing, but it turns out they were right, doesn't it? Well, you know, with hindsight, all right, they didn't have the, they didn't do the work we did. It was easy to say, don't do it, all right? All I know is, you, you know, governor, one of the primary jobs of governors uh, is to try and grow the economy. I spent eight years, Tim, all over the state, visiting with businesses, talking to businesses. We used to go up to Massachusetts and have dinner with groups of businesses that, that might be thinking about coming here. Uh, you you got to do your homework. And the board and EDC did our homework. And those outside didn't have that information. And so maybe they would have made the same conclusion, okay? Had they had the same information, maybe they would have concluded, don't do it. But that's, you know, I, I can't deal with that. All I can deal with is that 12 people, including me, who are top-notch business people and community leaders, the head of Rhode Island Hospital, the, 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 the head of the AFL-CIO. Not gaming right. industry experts, they, though. No, right. but we had outside experts, okay? We had, we had experts about the gaming industry come in and give all of that analysis. That's why they came to the conclusion that given the strategy of trying to build a digital media segment to the economy of the state here, which fit with what RISD was doing in terms of producing graduates. Hasbro had built a whole studio uh, there in Pawtucket. Uh, there's a lot of digital software activity going on in the state. We just felt this was a good opportunity. Well, here we are now. So taxpayers are poised to spend roughly $100 million to pay off bondholders for this mess. Uh, there's been some talk that Rhode Island shouldn't pay back bondholders. Do you think the state should default on the bonds? Well, I, I think the state needs to look at, first of all, this was not an unequivocal obligation of the taxpayers. This was not a general obligation, okay? That's why it's carrying, I've forgotten what the interest rate is, 6, 7%, yeah. all right? If, if this was a, an airtight obligation of the state of Rhode Island, it would have carried probably a 2% interest rate. So the investors in those bonds knew that there was a risk here that the state was not completely obligated. That's why it's called a moral obligation. It's not, it's, if I remember the documents say that it's contingent. Those payments are contingent upon the General Assembly appropriating the money. Yeah, that's right. It, all right. So all I'm saying is this is not an absolute slam dunk obligation of the state. No. It's, it's interesting from a, a former banker to hear that the state should be considering not paying back. No, home. because it's not a general obligation. Yeah, I, I, right? I, I understand there's, what there's you're saying. There's a big saying, difference. But all the right. governor, the state budget chief, Rosemary Booth uh, Gologli, who gave you a lot of guidance, General Treasurer Gina Raimondo say that would be a mistake. It could be disastrous for Rhode Island trying to get bonds. Well, I don't, I, I, you know, again, you, you got to do the analysis, do the work. I, I don't believe that that's necessarily true at all, okay? Because there is a world of difference between over here this is an unequivocal obligation of the state. That's what we do when we issue general obligation bonds. All right, to default on those would be, you know, really unprecedented and serious. This over here is a moral obligation. It's carrying an interest rate three times as high. So the investors knew that there was a risk 
to this. If they felt that this was a slam dunk that the state of Rhode Island was going to pay these bonds, well, why would we be paying 6%? Mm. So leave the so, door open. So I think, yeah, you have to leave the door open. Okay. And I, I think there's a lot of work that's got to be done before that's concluded. I think a lot of people want to know why you waited until now to break your silence. Well, two things. When, when I left office, I sort of vowed, look, not, not to way back in. I mean, there's lots of things that have, have happened that you know, I didn't agree with. I spent eight years of my life trying to make this a better state on all fronts, all right? And, uh, and I think we accomplished a whole lot of things, Tim, uh, whether it be education, whether it be coming over here on the, the highway, uh, you know, whether it be building downtown Providence, whether it be, by, be, by the way, before the crash, economically, we were doing very well. There's more construction that went on in downtown Providence in my tenure of eight years than I think if you look back probably over in decades. So, 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 why so all, all I'm saying is I sort of said, it's not appropriate for a former governor to come back in and start weighing in. Uh, number one, I made that decision, and hence you'll recall I've really been uh, not speaking out on anything. All right. Two, at the time this sort of uh, broke, I felt for me to weigh in on it would be unhelpful to the whole process. If there was a chance that they were trying to work out, because if I recall they were talking about uh, uh, film credits. So it looked to me from the outside that maybe there was a deal cooking to do something. For me to weigh in in the middle of that, gum it all up, would not be helpful. Well, what was that moment like when you learned that 38 Studios was absolutely imploding? Oh, no, it was very sad. It was very sad, all right? And, and people will say, well, that's because, Governor, you, you, know, you were involved. But no, it was very sad for 300 people, all right? My, I think I told you my daughter was in the real estate business, and she helped like, you know, a, a family that moved into the town that was a 38 Studios uh, person. Uh, so you see all those people. So I felt very sad, Tim, and, uh, uh, you know, surprised, surprised that this was a surprise. <laughs> see, that's the part from the outside. I mean, I've been, I'd been away from it almost a year and a half. Okay? I, you know, the election was in November, mm -hmm. then it was transition uh, time, and... Uh, and so here we are in April, and I'm reading that this company is struggling and they're running out of money. And that's how you learned about it yeah. in the media. Yeah. All right, uh, I got a final question for you. Um, you know, I think everyone can appreciate hindsight is 2020. Saying that, do you regret it now? Well, you know, I regret what happened, sure. Okay. Nobody wanted this. Do I mean, you, if you talk to you the 12 people... Do you regret being a champion of this project? No, 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 no. You, you do, you make the best decision you can at the time, all right? Economic development, you know, for states is highly competitive, uh, it, it, and it's risky, all right? Everybody said, well, Massachusetts passed on this. If I recall, Massachusetts also put a lot of money into a solar company that went belly up. Uh, states, that's what's happened. And, and as you were and I were talking off air, if I look over the last decade, the state of Rhode Island has probably spent a billion dollars in economic development, whether that's be the historic tax credits, the film credits, the GTEC, uh, you know, people like Brown and Sharp and umpteen others. We got, we got general, uh, 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 the food company, Natural Food, <laughs> I've forgotten the name of it now, that came from Connecticut headquartered here, all right? We gave them money to put in solar panels on the roof. United so, Natural Foods. Yeah, United Natural Foods, thank you. Uh, there's lots of that, you know, and so economic development for states is a proactive business, and, you know, you, you, you hope you never fail, but the reality is that there are going to be some that don't work out. And, uh, yeah, is it, do I feel badly? Yeah, of course I do. I really do. I mean, but, but I don't know <laughs> from the outside and I'm not in office, whether some more could have been done, because this should have been anticipated long before April. There should have been conversations, and that's why I'd be interested to see what the EDC board minutes show. There should have been conversations, Tim, on this, going back six, eight months before that, that said, hey, guys, you know, the cash flow looks like it's getting tight. What are we doing here? And what are you doing? you know, in terms of additional equity, et cetera. Now, maybe that was going on. I don't know that. But uh, if it was, it certainly, you know, didn't appear that way at the end. It looked like a scramble at the end. Are you concerned this is what you're going to be known for? No, I, well, I hope not. <laughs> okay, that's my point, okay, that, that when you spend eight years 
All right. And by the way, we've probably spent, uh, we probably saved the taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars over those eight years. If you go back to the, uh, the, the uh, but, but you have no health control insurance. over perception, you know? No, I understand that. Yeah. And, I, and that's why I felt that it's time to try and put some perspective on this and, and, and begin to bring some facts and, you know, some of the misinformation uh, and uh, make it clear that, you know, I spent eight years and, uh, on umpteen fronts and, and an objective analysis of that would say, and, and even with economic development, uh, that uh, you know, we were we were accomplishing a lot of things, Tim. Uh, so this, I think, was extraordinarily unfortunate, uh, and part of me just uh, believes, in my heart of hearts, that the more more could have been done to save this company. But I don't know that. And maybe everybody was working their guts out to do that. Governor, former Governor Don Kachiri, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. My pleasure. My